Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. I saw this lithographed tin plate toy shooting range being advertised by a fellow in Owen Sound, Ontario. It really looked interesting, so I decided it was worth the drive to go and get it. All I knew was that it was made by a company I'd never heard of, called Andy Guard. I imagined it was going to be something like the Electroshock Electro Shooting Gallery by, by Marx that I lusted after as a child. Squeeze off, shot after shot, with this electric rifle. And look, press the switch, and you've got a rapid fire from the machine gun. Reloads itself, too. When I brought it back to Mr. Brown's basement, I started doing research to find out what I could. It wasn't long before I hit the jackpot and found an ad for this very toy. I was intrigued. What exactly did I have? It says it uses the electric eye principle. Wow, in the 1950s? How could they do that? How could I do that? If I was going to make a simple circuit that would light up when a photo cell was hit by a beam of light, it wouldn't be very complex. It would be a photo cell, a transistor and a couple of resistors, and a bulb. In this case, I've got an LED. I've got a piece of electrician's tape over the cell. But when I let it get some light, it turns on the light. Otherwise, the light goes out. Back in the day, they would have used a more primitive photo cell, and they would have used a germanium transistor rather than a silicon transistor. The circuit wouldn't work quite as well as my circuit does. But the parts would have been much more expensive. If I was designing this sort of toy, I would have an on-off switch powering a motor and a switch circuit. Also, a gun light with a trigger. The trigger would turn the gun light on. The motor is spinning a disc with a tiny hole. If the gun light is on, while the hole is exposed to the LDR, light-dependent resistor, the switch circuit turns on the score light. That's how I would design it. But how it's actually done with this toy, we'll find out once we open it up. It's made up of pressed paper, bent metal, and plastic. This is plastic, and I think this, that's plastic too. There's no service manual for this, and I've never opened this up before, so this is going to be as new for me as it is for you. My goal will be to make it work. Well, it's missing some parts. It may be missing parts I don't know about. I understand that there is a battery holder lock or something right there that I'm missing. Here's the battery compartment. It looks like it holds either three C's or D's. And somebody's been in there. I don't know what they've been doing. Let's take a look inside. Inside, it looks like there is a motor. And there is a group of three wires that come from the far end. There are also two wires coming from the gun. I don't know if that's for the lamp. Maybe there's no trigger switch at all. There's a separate switch over here, which has three wires coming from it. So maybe that's the trigger. I don't know yet. The back is held on with these bendable tabs, very much like the tabs in the ray gun I fixed and used it to save the world. You can unbend these and bend them only a certain number of times before they break off. For that reason, I won't put the back back on until I'm certain everything is working properly. The plot thickens. With the end off, here is the disc that one shoots at. There are no holes through which that light would go to hit a photocell because there's no photocell. It's certainly not photoelectric. We can conclude then that the electric eye principle claim is... So how does this thing work? It looks like the disc sits on this and the motor turns it with friction on this end here. Also, there's a buzzer. It appears to be connected up to the bulb. When the bulb lights, it also energizes the buzzer. It's worth giving it a try to see if that works. Got the power supply set at three volts. The bulb is working and the buzzer works. Let's see about the motor. The red and the blue wires go to the motor. 
So I'm going to give the motor about 3 volts. Applying friction to the motor, which will happen if the disc is there, causes the motor to turn. And that would turn this. This seems to connect through a rod underneath this metal piece to here. Okay, let's see what's underneath that. Things are getting interesting. This is a copper disc on one side and an insulating disc on the other. Metal rivets poke through the insulating disc. The contact at the end of the gun will touch a rivet if it's in the right place at the right time. That, that red thing, that's a double pull switch. Well, I think it's time to make a schematic, if I can, of this thing, because I don't know how this operates yet. Looking at the battery container, they have labels for wires. That will help me figure out how it was originally wired. This is the circuit, not using the way it was wired up, but using the markings on the battery container. The front switch applies 3 volts to the motor, so high speed, the rear switch is low speed, 1.5 volts to the motor. Bad news, when you press the front switch and the rear switch at the same time, you short out one of the batteries. I would have been so much happier in a flashlight or in a box of cornflakes. When you press the trigger, you turn on the bulb on the gun every time. But you only turn on the buzzer and the score light if the rotating disc hits one of the rivets. In effect, you think you're aiming for something on the moving target, but you're actually aiming for one of the rivets on the spinning disc. The whole thing depends on a low resistance path between this contact over here touching one of those rivets which comes through on the other side of this disc and makes contact with this rod which eventually connects up to the other end which must make good contact with the frame because it connects to the light and to the buzzer very clever but not electric eye The rivets coincide with the bull's eyes on the disc that you're supposed to be shooting at. The lion, the rhino, the tiger, and the elephant. Hmm. Glad we're not going after anything endangered. These rivets are what makes the connection. And they're not making very good connection now. Because they're badly oxidized. Using a small piece of fairly rough sandpaper and I need to clean the copper on this side where the rivets come through and this side where the rivets are exposed. They're really oxidized and maybe 20,000 ohms. In other words, they're insulators. So they have to be completely cleaned. The oxidation is really bad and the contact is extremely poor. So I've taken the disc off and I'm going to sand it within an inch of its life and continue sanding this rod so it makes good contact with that central hub. Not the best design, but I don't think it was meant to last 65 or 70 years. It looks a lot better, but it's still not perfect. So what I'm going to do is drop solder on each of those rivets so there's a better connection between this copper disc and the rivet. At the hub, I've cleaned that inside and out. It's better, but not perfect. The four rivets have been soldered and I'm going to put it back together. This end is more or less taken care of now. All the connections have been soldered and uh, covered with heat shrink. I don't have a latch for this door cover, but you know what? I don't think it's going to be a big problem, and I'm beginning to think it's C-size batteries. I could probably fashion something if I had to. It would be nice if I had a 3D printer, but not yet. The next problem seems to be that I don't have continuity from here, this rod which runs through the metal, and the metal. But I guess there's too much oxide and it's not making a good contact. The problem continues to be that this rod here has very poor contact, even though it sounds like it has good contact, it has very poor electrical contact with 
the frame. And without that, no current flows. So what I'm going to do is not the ideal solution, but better than nothing, I'm going to use a piece of copper wire. I'm going to wrap it around here. It's like, like a bushing almost. And hopefully that will make good enough contact for the once or twice per decade this game gets played. That's the solution I have. Just copper wire wrapped around that rod. I've cleaned it, I've scraped it, I've sanded it. Still not a great contact, but that's about the best I can do. There was probably a retaining clip on this to prevent this paper disc from falling out. I don't have that kind of retaining clip. So I've got a pulley here, nylon pulley, and I'm going to try sticking it on with some silicone or something like that. Yeah, silicone. Not to the paper, but between the pulley and the shaft. There's not a lot of stress on that because of the red indexing pin. So a little bit of silicone inside the pulley. The pulley will make it stuck enough so that it won't come off. Before I get to the grand reveal of the toy finished and working, I'm going to share some of the information I found out about this electronic shooting range and the Andy Guard company that produced it. You may have to pause the video to read it. Well, there you have it. I guess it works. I hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed making it. If you did, please consider subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.